purpose for our call to worship this morning comes from Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All right, let's worship. We're going to sing a new song about the solas of the Reformation. We can stand together on the solidness of God's word in this first verse. Let's sing your word alone together. Your word alone is solid ground. The mighty rock on which we build. In every line the truth is found. that were once by sin and slain now by your power have been made new now by your power now by your power our forces. Gloria, Gloria, glory to God alone. Gloria, Gloria, glory to God alone. All our sins are stones at the bottom of your ocean and all our filthy stains have been washed away by the blood of his son I 
sound church oh my soul praise him oh my Scripture is our call to confession of sin from Mark 1. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Join me in prayer as we confess our sins together. Almighty God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. O oh Lord, we pray have mercy upon us. Spare us our guilt as we confess our faults. And according to your promises declared to mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord, restore us to right relationship and fellowship with you. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. And now, be assured of the pardon of our sin from Isaiah 44. Remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. 
thankful to the Most High God for our redemption. We respond, thanks be to God. Amen. Let's raise our voices together. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me Because God has not only reconciled us back to himself, but also to one another. Please turn and greet one another and prepare your hearts for his word. Good morning. Welcome to New City Church. Uh, glad that you're here. 
and I'm actually glad that I forgot to bring up the announcements because I can now just jump right into the sermon. So I don't have the announcements on me, uh, but you probably got a weekly on your way in. We'd love for you to check that out. Everything on there is uh, ways for you to get involved with the church and just uh, an opportunity, thanks, sir, an opportunity to uh, hear more about what's going on with us. Uh, we would love to have a conversation with you if you are new or re relatively new to the church or maybe you've been around a while and you don't know what's going on. Uh, with how to get connected, please fill out the connect card that is in front of you in the pocket um, on the chair, or you can go online if there's not a card there, and you can fill that out online. Our connect card will answer your questions, and we will be praying for you. Uh, we are finishing a short series here in 1 John 4, verses 7 through 12, and I would love for you to stand with me as I read this passage and we'll be focusing in on verse 11 and 12 today, and we'll uh, talk, about, uh, uh, talk about this scripture here in a moment. These are the words of God. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Let's pray. Father God, we uh, humbly come before you as a local church, but also as the church. And in times like these, there has been many obstacles, challenges, sin, uh, many things to be repented of, many things to uh, look deep in our heart and try to understand what is the root of the way that I am believing, acting, and trusting in you, or not trusting in you, and how is the Holy Spirit going to eradicate that from my heart so that I can follow you, I can trust you deeper, I can love you more and love others more? Uh, there's many things that we come to a service like this, uh, we would call it baggage, you would call it sin, and God, we'd ask that uh, you would reveal to our own hearts in ways that may be new today how we have not loved like you ask us to how we have not trusted like you've asked us to. And God, we pray that you would uh, heal your church in this land, that you would convict us of our sin, that we would be uh, not looking out into the culture wondering what is wrong with it, but we would look e deep within our own hearts of what is wrong with us, how have we strayed from you, how have we uh, disobeyed you, how have we lacked trust in you. And we would come to this table at the end of our time here today and we would repent of those sins. We would receive your grace and mercy. We would know that because of your death on the cross, we have salvation, we have blessing, we have grace, and we can live in that reality and that truth each and every day. So God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts uh, be pleasing to you. And Will you bless this time in this particular text? And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. So, 1 John 4, 7 through 12. Uh, this actually, this book, this letter is a lot about love. And I wanted to enter into a discussion for these last several weeks about love uh, because I feel like we're in a historic time in the land of Christianity, in the church. And I think it's a winnowing. I think it's a, a separation, if you will, of people who are believing nominally, meaning by name only. They believe in their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then there are those people who are true followers of Christ, who are not uh, perfect by any means, but they seek to understand the, the truth of what God has said in his text, and because of that truth, how we are to love one another biblically and not through an emotional experience only. So today I'm going to finish this 
I don't know if it's going to be hard or easy, so we'll just see how God works that out, uh, how, it, how it's received by your heart and by your mind. Uh, but I want to start with the context of what's being discussed in this particular book leading up to chapter 4. And go over the context because, as we know, in hermeneutics or the art and science of interpreting the Bible, context is king. John was a very close disciple of Jesus Christ. He was nicknamed the Son of Thunder. He was one of the closest, if not the closest, uh, disciple to Christ. And he tells us that Jesus is the word of life. There are two concepts there, one being the word, that is truth, that Jesus is truth, and he is also life. There is, in his truth, a way to live, an understanding of what true life is, and basically, I said it this way last week, he was born in a manger, yes, humbly, yes, he uh, walked around in sandals and a robe, yes, many people thought he was just a peasant carpenter, yes, but he rose from the grave, he died on a cross, rose from the grave, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the creator, and he is the giver of both general revelation, meaning what you can see out in the world in creation. You can see God exists. He is the author of general revelation and, of course, the author of specific revelation in the text of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation. So he is... He is, yes, a a person who walked the earth, but he is also king of kings and lord of lords, and he said some things. He said some things. They're contained in Scripture, and if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, at a bare minimum, Scripture says you long for, you desire, like a deer pants for water, the truth of God's word. Like, you may not be that really disciplined person that, you know, 5.45, the alarm rings, and you're up and having your quiet time. You may not be that disciplined, but you have a longing and a thirst for God's word. I'm going to mention this later. I'm going to try and mention it several times because it's super important to understand there is one perfect interpretation of the text of Scripture. There are not multiple interpretations where I get to pick and choose at a buffet table which interpretation I like. You happen to be at a place where we preach the perfect interpretation every Sunday. No, I I jest a little bit in that. My job as a pastor, our job as believers is to get to the interpretation of the text. Does any human other than Jesus Christ do that perfectly? Absolutely not. But that is our call. That is our trajectory is to know and understand what does the text say and what is that perfect interpretation? What has God said to us that many times we don't see clearly because of our sin and our flesh, but what has God said to us and what he has said to us needs to be proclaimed, especially in times of history like now, like now. I'm going into a lot about how to love one another because for the foreseeable future and in the foreseeable past, we are going to talk about the truth of God's word. And if anyone in this local body is is concerned, has questions about, would dispute something, please come and please talk to us about it. We would love to talk to you about it. But I'll just have to say, bring some Bible verses, okay? Don't bring feelings and emotions about a particular subject or doctrine. Bring some biblical understanding to that because the context of this particular book is truth. And what Jesus said needs to be proclaimed in all of its truthfulness, especially in times of history like now. Why do I say in times of history like now? You don't see it maybe. Um, You don't you know, have, have the counseling load that the elders of our church do or the, the, uh, maybe the behind the scenes at times understanding of what's going on in the culture of the church. But in times of history like now, there is a great 
separation, if you will, of different false teachings spurred on by antichrists that are infiltrating the church. And so we want to be a church and we want to be a people that proclaims the truth of God's word no matter what the consequence, especially in times of history like now. Third, context. Jesus is the great advocate of his saints slash believers. Who has felt persecuted, maligned, and in general disliked over the past year? I have. Probably more than I ever have in my history. And I hate saying that because I know God's like, oh, now I got to bring you another tough season. Because he likes to one-up it. You know, it's like, this was tough and you grew. And you're not growing enough, so here comes another one. I hope not. I hope maybe there's a season of, <clears throat> you know, peace and harmony and reconciliation and true love for each other coming. We'll see. But Jesus, in those moments, is the great advocate of his saints and his believers. Just listen to a great talk. As I uh, get ready for preaching on Sunday mornings, I'll read something or I'll listen to maybe uh, another pastor doing a devotional or, or a sermon just to uh, allow my spirit to, to hear from God in a, in a deeper way that helps me before I preach. And this particular pastor just said, uh, said, if you're being maligned, if you're being mistreated, one of the ways you can guard against bitterness infiltrating your life is remembering that Jesus is the great advocate of his saints, his believers. And more importantly, he has a plan. He has a plan. So he gives us strength and power and guidance, and he gives us true love for our brother. And fourth piece of context that we need to go into, there is a growing hatred of the ways of the world in the life of the believer. I use the word hatred on purpose because it's in the text. There is a growing hatred in the life of a believer for the ways of the world. There isn't a growing accommodation for the ways of the world. There isn't a growing appreciation for the reasoning of the ways of the world. There is a growing hatred of the ways of the world in the life of the believer. Do not love the world or what? Anything in it. There is a decision to be, or excuse me, to love God and to hate the world or scripture says you will love the world and by definition hate God. Those words are used in the text of Scripture. We have to understand that's what's leading into this discussion of love. Fifth piece of context, there is a spirit of the Antichrist that wants to dece uh, deceive and distort, so be on guard. Be on guard. There is a spirit of Antichrist, meaning things that are not of Christ, that is in the world, that is trying to deceive and distort. And remember, deception is... Deceiving. Deception is deceiving. We'll get there. I know this is your third time through the context, but do you remember all these? Maybe I'll just skip. Does everybody remember all seven of these, and I'll just skip them all? Okay, good. We'll go through them. Uh, so if there is a spirit of the Antichrist that wants to deceive and distort, and you are to be on guard, how does it say in this text to do that? Test the spirits. Be discerning especially in the floundering of today. Because confessing Christ doesn't mean just saying his name. Confessing Christ means you're coming in line with Christ's truth. That's the word used, homologeo, meaning coming in line with Christ's truth. This is what it means. You do not stand over the Bible and interpret it and allow it to be conformed to your understanding. The Bible stands over you, and you are to conform your understanding to it and what it clearly teaches. So, confessing Christ means to come in line with the truth of Christ. And seven, love is the trajectory of the, uh, of the Christian, but it is a love 
that is biblically defined, that is Jesus given and spirit empowered. Love is the trajectory of the Christian, but it is a love that is biblically defined, Jesus given and spirit empowered. By definition, it does not look like what the world calls love. It is not going to look anything like, maybe there'll be hints, but it's not going to ultimately look anything like what the world calls love. God's love is this word agape or agapeo, which is affection and concern. Many of us stop at con uh, confection, that's sh sugar. Affection. And we don't get to the concern part. Many of us just focus in on the concern and we don't get to the affection part. And again, I, I mentioned last week that I used to be taught that agape love was unconditional love and, and God does love those that he saves unconditionally, but agape love is not unconditional love for, everything, uh, for everybody. God's love is an affectionate concern and he wants us to love each other in this way and we talked a little bit about what that example was last week, and we'll get to that again. It was this big word, propitiating for our sins. Propitiation is forgiveness and cleansing. And this is how you know it's a miracle. He did it even in our rebellion. So let's start today's text. Verse 11 starts with this word again, second time it's mentioned in this uh, short section, beloved. Beloved. I have to say it. And if you're one of the thousands of listeners online right now, or one of the uh, hundreds in, in our sanctuary at this moment, beloved does not mean everybody. Beloved is believers. If you come to Christianity with this generalized notion that God, when he says beloved, he's talking to you, even in your rebellion, even in your sin, even in your rejection of Christ, you are sorely mistaken. You are not the beloved of God. The beloved of God is the audience of believers. And there apparently is an issue with those believers with love in the church. They're probably not loving each other the way they're supposed to. And I have a feeling it's somewhat of a reflection of the way we can uh, consider love not just in our local body here, but in the church in general. Uh, there's an issue, and John wants us believers to understand love. Why? Because it's hard to understand the love of God in our own flesh and humanity without the miracle of regeneration, without the miracle of being saved by Jesus. We think we can develop or discipline love into our lives, but John says it is a <clears throat> excuse me, supernatural gift and it is rooted in the demonstration of God's love for us. So he says, beloved, if God so loved us, we've got to talk about this, if God so loved us, what is he referencing there? He's referencing verse 10. Um, and one second while I get some water. Got a little frog in my throat. It's not a COVID frog, I promise. Andy's the only one who laughs. I can't joke about COVID anymore. All right. In spite of us not loving God, it says in verse 10, in spite of us not loving God, God loved us. He sent his son, excuse me, to be slaughtered like a lamb on the altar, to be the propitiation for our sins, and we absolutely don't deserve it. We don't recognize this, and we are still forming God's love to our image rather than being transformed by God's love and living in that love and showing that love to each other. We also ought to love one another. So if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Um, this is where I'm going to spend a, a, quite a bit of time because I think this is something that, again, is, is a, a challenge to our heart and mind, but it's something that we got to go through. We also ought to love one another. I visited with a Christian counselor 
uh, a long time ago, and he gave me a book to read to kind of help sharpen my counseling skills. And even though I, you know, would, would have been hopeful that this book would have been, you know, the Bible, number one, or maybe a, a really wonderful Christian counseling text by, by a, a knowledgeable uh, a biblical man, a biblical counselor, this particular book had some good stuff in it, but it was a secular counseling book. And much in the book, even though it had some good stuff, much was lacking. One of the things that this particular book talked about was something called should statements. And the, the premise of the book about these should statements were that when you talk to yourself in your inner mind, which is kind of weird, like the way they described it, but okay, we'll go with that. When you talk to yourself and you're constantly saying, I should do this and I should do that, this particular author called that a cognitive distortion. Meaning the way that we think, if it's full of should statements, is distorted. And this is the cause of anxiety and depression and many other uh, mental ills that are a result of these should statements. I've thought about that particular counsel from that Christian counselor and that book many times over the course of my Christian life, over the last two decades or more that I've known about this particular book. And this is the conclusion that I came to. Scripture is full of should statements. It's full of oughts and shoulds. Okay? And, and why is that? Because Jesus, when he left the planet and ascended into heaven, he told us that we should proclaim the gospel and we should teach people to feel really good about themselves. No. Um, that we should teach people to um, try, and, try and live better lives through moral behavioristic modification. No. He said that we should teach people how to obey or to obey all the things that he has commanded. That's why the Bible is full of should statements and oughts. It's about obedience, saying you should really live this way. You ought to live this way. Believers <clears throat> should and ought to be obedient to Jesus in all things. And notice I said believers. Now, in my pastorate, I, I don't even, I don't know why I even am allowed to say that, but in my pastorate, um, since about 2000, let's say, uh, in my pastorate, the people that have the most problems with me just saying what I said, that we're called to be obedient to Christ, are believers. People who call themselves Christians are, are the ones that argue against the should and the ought statements more so even than unbelievers. It's very strange to me because John makes the case in this text that if you're a believer, you should want to be obedient to Christ. There is something, now are you perfectly obedient? John would say no. He says that if you claim to have no sin, you're a liar. Like he uses strong words like that. Maybe in our culture we'd say, you're kind of a, a mistaken. Okay? He wouldn't call, call you a liar. Okay? But obedience is part of the Christian life. And it's not all the time, or shouldn't be all the time, I used the should statement there, just about obligatory obedience, but that is part of it. It should be a growing desire that we should and ought to be obedient to Jesus in all things. But this is the problem. We don't understand what biblical oughts and shoulds are rooted in. The word ought, translated from the original language that this was written in, means obligation and debt. So John is saying, we ought to love one another if God so loved us, 
And the ought there is an obligation and a debt. So it's a biblical obligation and debt that John is saying we have to have to love one another. And this is why it's a biblical obligation and debt. It's rooted in a gift. God gave us a gift. His name is Jesus Christ. He died on a cross. He rose from the grave. He said he would send the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And it is rooted in this supernatural change of heart. It's a gift. And it's also rooted in that word that we looked at last week, God's propitiation. So he says you ought to love one another. I think what he's saying is you need to meditate on the propitiation, God's forgiveness of your sin and cleansing of your sin through Jesus' death on the cross. You should meditate on that. And we shouldn't keep on sinning so that more grace would abound, or we shouldn't keep on sinning thinking that it's just okay, I'm saved, I can continue to go on with my life as normal and sin as normal. Propitiation wrought in the heart of the believer will grow oughts and shoulds as joys and hopes. It's life. That's what John wants us to know. It, it, it's life. All of life is oughts and shoulds. But whose and what is the impetus for your oughts and shoulds? If it's to the world, it's slavery to sin. It's lies. It's deception. It's flesh. If it's to Christ... It's slavery to the perfect master and knowing he has nothing but love and blessing for you, even in the toughness of life. We also ought to love one another, and the root of that is the sovereign forgiveness and cleansing of sin given to the believer. That is the fuel. And like Peter would say, where else are you going to go? What treadmill are you going to put yourself on that allows you to live in peace and in joy and in hope and in grace of Christ, but also in obedience to Christ because that's where life is? So we ought to love one another. What does this mean? We need to have affection and concern for one another. I am not a perfect man. Mark Billman is a little closer to perfect than I, and Andy is less than both of us. Perfect. But we have an affection for you. We have an affection for you. I am up many nights with sadness or maybe joy because of my affection for you. It is not perfect. It is not maybe where it even needs to be, but I have an affection for you. These men have an affection for you as the leaders in this church, the elders in this church, and they also are very concerned. I am very concerned. I would plead with you like Paul may be pleading in the book of Romans. I would urge you. I would uh, do everything in my power to tell you, please, because of our affection and concern for you, please don't find yourself in one of the three areas that I have had discussions with people in our body over the past year. And I'm not talking about just a couple of conversations. I'm talking about dozens of conversations that myself and our other elders have had with believers in this church. And I've broken them down into three categories. And Mark and Andy can correct me or add to these or subtract from these. But these are basic categories of conversations that I have that I am very concerned about. Number one, adding to the gospel adding to the gospel. Paul says in Galatians, if you add to the gospel, and I'll explain what I mean by that here in a moment, you are in a dire situation. 
Adding to the gospel is making salvation, the atonement of Jesus Christ, his propitiation of sin, and all that the cross entails about adding to that, saying that you can only be saved if you do that, plus something else. I I heard one pastor say it this way, and it was not a gospel issue in terms of Jesus saving people. He said that if you're not in line with his thinking on this particular subject, you better check your justification. Checking your justification is pastor code for he's questioning if you're saved if you're not in line with this particular edition of the gospel. Don't add to the gospel. If you read in Galatians, you'll see that that will not go well for you. It's currently not going well for the church. And it is something that you need to be on guard of because it is anti-Christ. Second, divisive anti-Christian doctrines. I've had many conversations about divisive anti-Christian doctrines. Again, I can't go into the detail of everything that it is, that, that, that is. But division happening over things that are clearly not expressed in God's truth or they've been aberrations of what God has expressed in his truth in the Bible. And they are causing divisions. The biggest reason I'm doing this particular series right now is because of the divisiveness in the church over antichrist doctrines. Third conversation that I've had, and this might, this might hit home, okay? If you stand up and walk out now, it will just tell me that this hit home. So you have to go to the restroom. You got to wait. Affection and concern for the world more than Christ. Affection and concern for the world more than Christ. One of the greatest things, and this was told to me by a man who I think has apostatized, meaning he's walked away from Christ, but he said something when I knew him, and he was, he was a pastor, and it seemed like things were, were together, and, and he said something that always stuck with me, is you're going to be challenged in your pastorate many times of where your affection and concern lie, where your love lies, and you always have to remember that you need to love God more than the world. He even said, you need to love God and hate the system of the world. Friends, when we see in the text of Scripture a clear presentation of what a particular truth is, and because people don't like it, the world fights against it, they want to... uh, do all they can to push that truth down, suppress the truth, like in Romans chapter 1, and we cave, and we accommodate, and we appease, we have an affection and concern for the world more than Christ. So, remember the context. Remember that the context of this passage is rooted in the truth of the Lord and the life of the Lord, and the love of the Lord, and the propitiation for your sins. Let me remind you of what's becoming my favorite parable. I had no idea it was. The last two years has made this my favorite parable. The parable of the man who goes to the the owner of, of a business that he owes billions of dollars to. I'm paraphrasing, of course. And the owner says, I forgive you all billions of your debt. You can't pay it, it's gone. I, I, I forgive you. Get out. You're good. You're good to go. And that unforgiving servant turns around 
and find someone who owes him $5 a quarter, whatever is cheap to you. It's becoming lower and lower for me. A quarter, let's say. And he throws him in prison until he pays his debt. The, the analogy of that to what is going on in the Christian church and in the hearts and minds of people shows me and shows us through the lens of Scripture that we don't understand propitiation of our sins. The propitiation of your sins is this. You put Christ on the cross. You put him there. Your lies, my lies, your, your lusts, your passions that are not godly, your sin, whether small or great in your mind, put Christ on the cross. It put nails through his wrists and his feet. It put a spear in his side. It put a crown of thorns on his head. It made him be tortured and go through a kangaroo court and be whipped beyond the point of recognition. Your sin did that. My sin did that. And you have not arrived at some place where you can look at someone else's speck in their eye while having the log in your own and not understand that Jesus Christ died for your sin, even in your rebellion towards him. And his forgiveness of you is a gift you don't deserve. It is supernatural it is the only way that you can be saved is to put your trust in that atonement, in that sacrifice. And in putting your trust in Christ, he regenerates you and he gives you the power and the fuel to love others. That is not a mushy-gushy, virtue-signaling love. Now, John goes on to say, and we'll kind of wrap this up he says we ought to love one another because no one has ever seen god you know that's a true statement you can read about it john 1 18 and first timothy 6 16 those are some cross references to check out but no one has been able to look upon the perfect glory of god and survive other than christ and some have asked why is this here in this particular text well, it's a reminder of who we are and who God is. It's a reminder of what we can see of God when God's love is perfected in us. It is supernatural. You can't manufacture it. It's not something that you get to choose uh, for yourself. It is given to you. The power of it is given to you. It's a true love that cannot be seen in our futile attempts to profess a superficial, mushy-gushy love and love that is empty and short-lived. So if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us, and I think the meaning of this text is people will see the image of God, the essence of God, if we love one another. They'll see the abiding of God in us. They'll see his love perfected in us. If we will love one another, it is a sign that the God that cannot be seen abides in us. It gives us a true affection and concern. There are probably seasons and times where there needs to be more affection and less concern and more concern and less affection, but these times are a sign of the existence and truth of God for the believing community and for the world. It's miraculous, and it cannot exist outside of the abiding God in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. He gives us affection and he gives us concern. It's affection for those who are sinned against and affection for those who have sinned and are repentant. You know what sometimes affection looks like? Sometimes affection looks like sitting with someone who is weeping over their sin. Sometimes affection looks like shaking the dust off your shoes because someone is so stubborn 
and rebellious and obstinate in their sin that they need to be cut off in many ways from the community of believers so that they will be taught not to sin and to be repentant and to not blaspheme the name of Christ by living in their sin. That's, can, that can be affectionate. Sometimes it's affection for those who are sinned against. Many times it's sitting in that same office with those who've been greatly sinned against and wondering where is the justice of God and reminding them God loves you. He will show justice in this situation. He will be fair. He will show everyone who he is and what his nature is. And this sin that is against you is wrong. But we're here with you. More importantly, God's spirit indwells you and he is with you. Concern. Concern for those chasing folly wantonly. And concern for those being deceived by antichrists, adding to the gospel and not recognizing that all we need is the propitiation of Christ on the cross, the forgiveness and cleansing of sin. What else is there a concern of? And this is what we're going to get into, and we always have been in it, but we're going to raise the bar, raise the temperature on this. I have a deep concern for all of us rightly handling the word of truth. A deep concern for all of us rightly handling the word of truth. This kind of love that God gives as he abides in us, that is being perfected in us, uh, it, it being perfected has or abiding has this context of continuing to exist or keeps on keeping on in us. And it, powers, uh, it empowers perseverance in us to show us true love. And then his love is perfected in us. It becomes finished. It's brought to completion. It is being brought to completion. And when we see Christ face to face, it will be perfected. Now, I mentioned last week that I was going to share the gospel. This Every Sunday we share the gospel. Every sermon is about the gospel. Every sermon is about Jesus and his good news. But if what uh, I just described to you is, is something that you want and you're trying to figure out how do I get on the treadmill to achieve it, to earn it, you can't. This love is only available through the miraculous, saving power and grace of Jesus Christ. He created you in his image. You have sinned against him. Jesus came and died on a cross because he loved even when we hated him. He desired to relate and have relationship with us even when we wanted to be at war with him. And he says, if you will believe in and receive him as Lord and Savior... You will be saved. You can be baptized as a sign and a symbol of your repentance and belief and your identification that no longer are you Jesus plus. No longer are you adding to the gospel, but you know that you have been saved by grace. And like Paul, you can live the rest of your days. And like many other great saints in scripture and in church history, you can uh, uh, live your life in repentance and belief. That's what this communion table is about. It's remembering Jesus Christ crucified, risen, and coming again. There is great mercy and grace only available through the blood of Christ. And if you are saved by Jesus, there is something probably in your life right now that you are stubbornly holding on to Scripture has clearly said what you need to do in a particular area. It's confession of sin. It's making restitution or reconciling with other people. And you fight it and you fight it and you fight it. He says, come to the table. Confess it as sin. Admit to him what he already knows. And his blood and his body that was broken for you is sufficient for your sin. Be forgiven. Maybe for the first time, come to the communion table. If Jesus has saved you today, Receive these elements and give praise to God. Let's pray together. Father God, we are grateful for the cross. 
not because we earned it or deserved it, but because in lieu of our pride, in lieu of our rebellion, you still came. You died. And you reached down to us and you saved us and you made us new. I'll be honest, Father, we're just not right now in the life of the church living like we're new. We are allowing things to infiltrate and deceive and distort the message of the gospel. We are allowing other powers, other gods, other idols to try and show us a way that they can't. Only the creator of the universe can show us the way. And he died in our place on a cross for our sin so that we can be forgiven and cleansed. I pray, God, that all of us would return to that love and we would return to it in a way that that love is perfected in us. We have a great affection and concern for this local body. I pray, God, that you would give us wisdom, give us an understanding of what it means to be reconciled and restored in relationship, convict us of adding to the gospel so that we would come here today, repent and believe only in Jesus Christ. Thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. the labor of my hands can fulfill my lost demand could my zeal no rest but no could my tears forever flow for sin could not atone thou must say Wash.
and I will seek to dwell in the house of the Lord all my days, to gaze, to gaze upon your beauty, to worship at your feet, oh, one thing I see, Holy fire, Abba Father, my Redeemer, my delight, holy, holy, God Almighty, you're the one thing that I desire, holy fire, holy fire. To dwell in the house of the Lord all my days, to gaze upon your beauty, to worship at your feet. are new we'd love to chat with you and fill out a connect card please and now go in peace may the lord bless you and keep you may he make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace only found in jesus amen Amen.